these are classical texts taught in the Sun Sunni schools of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And through knowledge, we can divide the world. <coughs> knowledge is so important, and it's the only thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to ask for increase. And say, oh my Lord, increase me in knowledge. You're not allowed to ask for anything for increase except in knowledge. So the way we revive and we transform our communities is through knowledge. <coughs> if you look at the situation of the Arabs in the peninsula, Arabian peninsula, when the Prophet came, they were known as the Ummi people, illiterate people. The Quran and the Quran came with the Prophet and they became the top of the world through knowledge. So what you want to do is attain knowledge and practice it. So because the first responsibility of every human being is Iman, we're going to study the tenets of faith, and then, inshallah, through that, we'll teach our faith, and make our faith certain. Once this is done, then learn how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the two things we we'll focus on. So the first book is al risalat al nafiya wal Hujjat al qatiya It's a famous text, a contemporary text by Sheikh Abdul Sadiq al Taqwa, the Syrian scholar, passed away in 1986. And in here is a summary of the basic tenets of faith. So when we speak about the Aqidah, you have so many questions. So some people will say, Shall we do Milad? Is the Prophet does he know the unseen and so on and so forth? This is nothing to do with Aqidah. These are second issues pertaining to people's arguments and intellectual uh, pursuits. What we want to do is study and know that which Allah Ta'ala will question us about first. It's very important distinction. So when we read this book with a group of students some time ago, they started asking the question and said, if it's covered in the book, we'll deal with it. If it's not in the book, leave it. Why? Because the author spent his whole life gathering together what's absolutely necessary for people to know and he presented it to you for you to know. If it's not in there, we won't consider it necessary. If everything mentioned in this book, you understand it, you believe in it, your Iman is complete because this book focuses on the Iman bin Allah wa Malaika wa Al-Kutub wa Rusul wa Al-Yawmi Al-Akhir wa Al-Khayr wa Al-Khayr That's what it deals with. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was asked about Iman, he said that you believe in Allah and His angels and His books and His messengers, the last days and faith, good and evil. That's it. So Iman is focused on this. This is primary, primarily important for us because people dispute about things which are not necessary. It's very important. Point. And the second thing is, we take our evidences from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of the Prophet So I had a student not too long ago, about a month ago, and he said he was inclined towards what we call the modern Saudi phenomenon. He said, well, whoever I go to, they all say our evidence is from the Quran and the sunnah. So who is correct and who shall I follow? So I said to him, the Quran and the Sunnah, and the sunnah are the sources, both of these, these are sources for us to take our belief from. He said, well, everyone is talking about this and they're saying they're the So what do I do? I said, it's very simple. Nobody denies Quran for a Muslim at least. But what we can stand up against and we can reject is people's interpretation of the Quran or Hadith. So there's no denying that the Quran is true, the Hadith is true. But somebody's interpretation might not be right. And he said, How do I know this? Very easy. If somebody interprets a verse from the Quran or anything from the Sunnah of the Prophet, <coughs> which opposes the Quran or the Sunnah, that interpretation must be complete. Because there's no contradiction in the Quran itself and the Hadith of the Prophet. 
So anything we cover, if something is mentioned here which opposes the Quran al Karim openly or the Sunnah, it's not from our belief. So you reject something not on the not on the merit that it's from the Quran or the Sunnah, but somebody's interpretation of this. So somebody mentions the hadith to you and he says, Well the hadith says this. But the hadith doesn't say that. This is your interpretation in English concerning an Arabic text. So where is the problem? The problem isn't with the hadith. It's with the interpretation of the person who is trying to impose his interpretation upon you, saying this is belief. So our standards are the Quran and the Sunnah. If something is mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah, and it is as, in, as it is, we believe in it. But if somebody interprets and opposes anything from the Quran and the Sunnah, it's rejected. So that's your criteria. Somebody comes and says to you, well, the Hadith of Sharif says this. Okay. This is what it means and it contradicts something. This is not what the Hadith means. Otherwise, there will be contradiction in revelation. So it's very important you realize and you understand this principle before we start. Anything that's mentioned in the Quran and the if the author says something about it, it has to fit in within the remaining part of the Quran and the If it doesn't, if it's contradictory, then that interpretation is invalid. Remember the difference. Nobody denies hadith. Nobody denies hadith. You can't deny it because as a believer, as a Muslim, these are the sources of our revelation. So we'll start with the book. Some introduction before we start. He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa ba'd, inna mu'lam al-khilaf al-waqi fi masayid al-ilm al-tawqid al-qa'im wa bayna thalaf al-tirah. Wa humu al-ashaira wa al-mahdiyyat wa al-mu'atazila. He says, the great differences that exist in the interpretation of what Iman is, it exists between three main groups. Now you might well say, well, the 70 groups, the 72 groups, what's the three main groups? When the study and the science of Tawheed, Aqeedah, Ilm al kalam was first codified and recorded, three groups appeared. And it was to do with the interpretation, how they interpreted text, i.e. the Quran and the Sunnah. And in the Sunni school, so if you say somebody is from Ahlul Sunnah to Al-Jama'ah, then Imam al Aqidah, one of three people. Imam Abu Hassan al Ash'ari, Imam Abu Mansur al Maturidi, or Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. So, Imam al Ash'ari, most of the Shafi, the Hanabila, and the Maliki, they adhere to his interpretation and understanding. Not the difference. Again, the argument you hear. Who shall I follow, Abu Hanifa or Rasulullah? The question itself is wrong because Abu Hanifa is doesn't he doesn't oppose the Prophet He understands the Prophet way and he's presenting it to you. So it's not a case of either or. That's what that means. So when somebody says his he adheres to the Hanafi school. He adheres to the Hanafi school of understanding the hadith of the Prophet. Not a new religion, not opposing the hadith. Not the difference. So when we talk about these Imams in Aqidah, we don't say they are the ones who set out the talents of faith from it. We say this is their understanding of Aqidah and we agree with it. Because the source of your belief is the Quran and the not people. So not this difference. And then we have Abu Mansur al maturidi Most of the Hanafis, which is 55% of the world's Muslim population, adhere to these schools. And then you have the people of Hadith. Not the modern day Ahlul Hadith. No. The classical school, Sunni school, who adhere to the way of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal and the likes of Imam Atahal. They spoke about tenets of faith directly from the Quran and the Sunnah, but 
they didn't dwell into the details of it. This is the point. So hadith came to them, they said, we believe in it as it is, without interpretation. And that's the original school of Aqeedah. Later on, the Imams had to deal with things. So somebody came and said, for example, in the Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُبَايِعُونَ فَإِنَّمَا يُبَايِعُونَ اللَّهِ as a attempt at translation, the ayah is Verily, those who pledged allegiance with you, talking about the Sahaba, to the Prophet they have only pledged their allegiance with Allah. So in the past, the Arab used to pledge allegiance by putting hand in hand and say, I will support you. And the Sahaba used to come and read the Shahada and say to the Prophet, we will support you, we will aid you. We believe in you and you perform the prayer and give zakat, fast Ramadan, and perform Hajj if we're able to. So that was the act of prayer. Allegiance. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse he said, Verily, those who pledge allegiance with you, they only pledge allegiance with Allah, and Allah's hand is over their hands. So a group of people appeared. And they said, well, Allah has a limb, a hand, because the ayah says so. As the Sahaba, everybody who came after them for the first one, two hundred years, they accepted the ayah as it was and they believed in it, without interpretation. Without interpretation. Then a group of people came and said, look, the ayah says, literally, Allah's hand is over their hand which means Allah has a hand. So automatically your mind rises to an understanding of a limb with a thumb and four fingers. We said this is unacceptable. If you need to interpret it because you've got problems with anthropomorphism given Allah Ta'ala attributes of his creation, then you may say the approval of Allah Ta'ala or his satisfaction or his power as a figurative interpretation of the verse. We're not going to say this is what it means, but this is a plausible meaning countering your understanding of a neighbor. That's all we said. But this isn't real aqeedah. Real aqeedah is whatever Allah Ta'ala revealed, all of it's from Allah Ta'ala. We believe in it. I'm a Nabi. If we need to interpret, we can only interpret if we're trying to defend the creed of And the interpretation must not go against anything in the Qur'an of the Sunnah itself. So you might say, well, isn't their interpretation valid because Allah Ta'ala literally said the hand of Allah is over their hands. No problem. It is as it is, but without how and interpretation why. Because Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala clearly, explicitly states, لَيْسَ كَمِتْنِهِ شَيْءٍ There's nothing like Allah Ta'ala. So if you start giving Allah Ta'ala a direction, limbs, you're like one so you've gone against the direct command of the Quran. Explicit verse. This is what we mean by contradiction. If you interpret something, anything in the sacred law, and it contradicts that which is clear and explicit in the Quran and the Sunnah, your interpretation is incorrect, not the text itself. So no the difference. And so all the groups we have claiming to be on truth and so on and so on, they all have roots to these groups. So the Mu'tazila here, they said, the Qur'an is created, Allah Ta'ala has not been seen in the Akhirah, and so on, so on, so on. So, but these great differences, in Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we have the Ash'ari school, the Maturi school, and the Athari school. Their differences are nuances. It's only in the way they spoke about things that they expressed themselves. As for the core of it all, it's all the same. وَإِلَيْكَ بَيَانَ لِمُوجَةً لِكُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ مِنْ هَؤْلَاءِ مَا ذِكْرِ بَعْدِ الْفَرَقِ الْإِسْلَامِيَةِ الْأُخْرَاءِ الْخَضَرِيَةِ وَالْجَبَرِيَةِ وَالْحَرَامِيَةِ غَيْرَ أَنَّ الْخِلَافَ بَيْنَ الْأَشَاعِرَةِ الْمَاتُرِيَةِ لَيْسَ بَاسِعَ الشَّحْقَ وَخِلَى الْقَرِيَتَانِ لَا يَفْعَنُ فِي دِينِ صَحِيبِ وَفَضْلِ أما الخلاف بين الأشاعرة والمعتزلة وغيرهم من بقية الفرق فإنه شديد والجدال بينهم مسبوق بكثير من الحرج وضيق الصدق وضيق الصدق والله تعالى الواحد. So brief explanation into some of the early groups in Islam. 
who appeared and they came with innovation in belief. Innovation in belief is much more dangerous than innovation in action. So bid'ah, bringing something new and saying this is what aqidah is, apart from action, is much more dangerous because it can lead to kufr. It can lead to disbelief. So when we talk about Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, who do we mean? Those groups or those Imams who codified or recorded them in terms of faith. They didn't find it, they didn't form it, they didn't invent it. Because our source for Aqidah is the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sound hadith of the Prophet. What they did was they laid it out and codified it in a way we can understand it. Because if somebody says, well, I take directly from the Quran and Sunnah, unless he's an expert in Arabic language and all the other sciences, from morphology to rhetoric to geology and astronomy and geography and mathematics and algebra and so and so, then his claim to take directly from the Quran is baseless. It's baseless because the Quran of the is revealed in the Arabic language. And unless somebody has mastered the Arabic language, his access to the Quran is limited. So his understanding is also limited. So people who say, well, I take directly from the Quran and Sunnah have not studied any Arabic, don't understand any Arabic. And in reality, what they're doing, they're transmitting and taking other people's opinions and presenting to you. Again, that's blind following. That's not taken from the Quran and the Sunnah. So when we talk about these Imams, all we're saying is, this is how they presented the tenets of faith to us, and we agree with them in their understanding. That's all we're saying. We don't attribute our faith, our aqidah, to any particular person. It's taken from Allah and His Messenger from Allah. Very, very important. And so, Asha'ira and Al-Makhiriniya, these are words which might not be important to you. The most important thing is your faith is in accordance to Ahl Sunnah. That's all. Um, and Sumduna in the Imam, Abu Hassan, Ali, and Ismail, and Ashari, Majadu, Ala, and Abu Musa, and Ashari, Sahib, and Rasulullah, and Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ubayna, Abu Hassan, and Majadi, Abu Musa, and Abu Ala. So when we say Abu Hassan, and Ashari, he is actually the great grandson of Abu Musa al Ashari, the famous Sahaba, companion of the Prophet. So there's four generations between this Imam and Sayyidina Abu Musa al Ashari. So he was born in southern Iraq in Basra in 260 Hijri. And he passed away in 324 Hijriya. He was Shafi'i in his orientation towards Fiqh. He took the Hadith from the Sajai, the Hadith of 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 the Hadith he studied hadith, a famous <coughs> scholar suggested with one of the imams in Baghdad. And he took, initially, he took and understood his aqidah from the famous Mu'tazili scholar, Jubayi. Then, they had a dispute. And Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, he overcame his own teaching this issue of dispute. And then he abandoned him. 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 And then ما قالت الإسلاميين وكتاب الإنابة ووقع الانتفاع ووقف الانتفاع العقيدة الإسلامية. so initially he was inclined towards the Mu'tazili way. and so the modern day Saudi phenomenon 
they will speak and say these Ash'ari, the wrong or misguided because they are Mu'tazim. They are Mu'tazim because when Imam Ibn Hassan al-Ash'ari started in his quest for Mazur, he was inclined towards the Mu'tazim. Then when he disputed with his teacher and overcame him, he stood up on the pulpit on Friday and he said on the top of his voice, Whosoever knows me knows me, and whosoever doesn't know me, I am so and so and so and so. I have repented and I have dissociated myself with the idea of it. I used to say the Quran was created, I used to say Allah Ta'ala will not be seen in the Akhirah and so and so. I reject all these ideas. And then he authored words in rebuttal of these ideas and defending the creed of Bakr Sunnah So he then became an Imam in Aqidah, preserving the tenets of faith in his place. Ulma Turidiyya, umman subuna ila Imam Abi Masood Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Mahmud ibn Maturidi. Ulma Turidi is the one who 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 is the second Imam, Imam Abu Mansur al Maturidi, he is an Imam from Samarkand, the modern day Uzbekistan. And we adhere to his understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. We don't say he is the one who formulated our people. We don't say this. We are attributed, we adhere to him because of his understanding of the primary Bible text. And he passed away in 333. So between him and Imam Abu Hassan al Ashari, there's nine years. So they were contemporaries. And he was an adherent to the Hanafi school in his jurisprudence. And he wasn't a follower of Abu Hassan al Ashari al Aqidah. Rather, he was a detailed a specialist in the Hanafi schools. Abu Hanifa and his companions, Abu Yusuf, Muhammad, Zufa, Hassan al Dudui, all of them, they were the first people to codify and present Aqidah in a book form. They spoke about the Aqidah in the past. And so these Imams were reviving their understanding of the Book of Allah Ta'ala and the Sunnah of the Prophet. And before, before Abu Mansur al-Maturidi rahimahullah ta'ala, Abu Muhammad Abdullah ibn Sa'id al-Qutani, another man, scholar from Bukhara, who supported and defended and made clear the tenets of faith pertaining to Abu Sunnah al Jama'ah. Wa kana Abu Mansur al-Maturidi imam al-Jaleel wa al He was a master in many, many of the disciplines of Islam and the sciences. And he was an Imam in Aqidah. To this day, most of the Hanafis around the world adhere to his understanding of Aqidah. So when somebody says he's on the Maturidi school, this is what they're talking about. Somebody says he's on the Ash'ari school, this is what they're talking about. It doesn't mean to say that these people abandoned the Quran and Sunnah and took the Aqidah from the individual. It doesn't mean to say that. What it means is they adhere to the, their understanding of what they extrapolated from the Book of Abba Ta'ala and the Sunnah of the Prophet So if there's one thing you take away today is that our faith, our Aqidah, it's taken from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet That's it. Because revelation stops in the Prophet There's no more adding to the deen after the Prophet This is what it means by Bidah. You bring something which isn't from Allah and His Messenger and you say, this is a must. Nobody has the authority to do that. What we're saying is, our understanding 
is in agreement and adheres to this particular Imam who understood the primary text. That's all we say. He didn't formulate our Aqidah for us, neither did he invent somebody outside the Quran and the Sunnah. It's very important. So people will now come and say to you, Brother, why are you following Abu Hanifa when you should be following the Quran and the Sunnah? The question itself is al Abu Hanifa takes everything from the Quran and the Sunnah. So I'm in agreement with his understanding of the Quran. Nobody says I not take from the Quran and the Sunnah. Everybody says that he takes it according to the understanding of somebody who understands the Quran and Sunnah better than oneself. You take the book of Allah Ta'ala and take the hadith of Ali, make your own laws. This Islam is, is not taken without knowledge. These are men who met Sahaba, these are men who met students of the Sahaba. They had the vast, deep knowledge of the Arabic language and all the other sciences pertaining to these things. Then, after everything they used to say, It may be that I am affected by it. And they used to say, So, interpretation is not Quran and Quran. Remember this rule. Somebody's interpretation may be wrong. It doesn't mean to say he denies the Quran or something. So be careful in labeling and branding people say, no, you deny Hadith or you deny the Quran. No, he may be denying or refusing your interpretation of the Quran and the Sunnah. And that's valid. What's clear, he doesn't accept interpretation, nobody argues with it. So, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدُ Say Allah is one, nobody dis- disagrees with it, nobody interprets it, leave it. But aqimu salah establish the prayer, the details, the whole life of the Prophet is in front of in front of us in the hadith. Some imams took from this hadith and understood this, another one took from it. Valid interpretation. As long as you establish the prayer according to the way of the Prophet, it doesn't matter. So interpretation, there's room for it in Islam. But interpretation is only valid if it doesn't contradict the Book of Allah Ta'ala and the Sunnah of the Prophet and explicitly. It's only valid then. If there's a contradiction, it's not a valid interpretation. He has opened many books as well. Explain the Creed of Ahlul Sunnah al Jama'ah and defend it the Creed of Ahlul Sunnah al Jama'ah. Al Firaq al Mufadifa al Ahlul Sunnah al Jama'ah al Mu'tazma. There are certain groups who appeared in the past and they opposed Ahlul Sunnah al Jama'ah in their Creed or in their interpretation. And the most famous of them is the Mu'tazma. Their claim was the Quran al Kareem is created. And Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, he was tortured in his time because some of the Khulafa and the Salatin, they inclined towards this understanding. Because a lot of the viziers and the scholars and the ministers around them, they inclined towards this. And so they influenced them to say that the Quran and Quran was created. And so the Mu'tazila, the first group who came with this view of opposition. So the character Wasil ibn Atar, he was the founder of this matter. Al Muqallab ibn Ghazal, and look at the Medical and the Kana Yulazim of Hamanita Ghazali, who is the Medina Senator, Tamanin was the first senator, if there was a Latina, who made a fat and mea, the real Tikila, the Jami Yamiman, Fala and Hanasu, who were Padim and Matazila, or Sheikh of our old man of the Hola to Mandila to Bayan Mandila. اعتزل مجلس الحسن البصري رحمه الله تعالى وجعل الفرق أن المتكب الكبيرة ليس بالمسلم ولا لكافر قال الحسن البصري قد اعتزل لا ورسل فسموا بالمعتزلة وهم قد سموا سموا أنفسهم سموا أنفسهم أصحاب العهد الزوكي وقد كانت لهم دولة في أول المئة الثلاثة ثالثة ساعدهم بعد الخلفاء ساعدهم بعد الخلفاء فيها فشاع مثلهم ولكنهم وجدوا من قومة العليم من أشعر so, so, so this person, Wasil ibn Atar, used to 
to sit in the company of Hassan al Basri. He was born in year 80 Hijri at Medina al Munawwar, and he died in year 131 in the Khilafah of Hisham ibn Abdul Bali, one of the Hunans. People spoke about him, and he was the first person to introduce the idea a station between Iman and Bukhul. So people who commit grave sins on the day of judgment, they do make Tawbah, mind them and they go into paradise and go into hellfire. There will be somewhere in between. He was the first person to adopt this idea. And he used to sit in the company of Hassan al Basri rahimahullah ta'ala. And then he abandoned him and left. So Hassan al Basri, when he heard about him, he said, Adi'itazalana. He's abandoned us, he's left us. And so they were given the name of the people who abandoned the main group of Muslims. That's where their name comes from. They call themselves the people of justice, the people of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they had a great influence and a great power in the third century because many of the Khalifas of the Abbasi uh, dynasties, they inclined and supported their views. And as we said, uh, Imam Ahmad ibn Muhammad rahimahullah ta'ala, he was tortured and punished because he refused to accept and give in to what they were saying. The Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah stood up in defense and they destroyed his words. They destroyed their beliefs. Some people still have this belief. The Quran is created. There's a group known as the Ibadiyya. Most of them exist in Oman. And they still maintain beliefs by like this. They believe the Quran is created. They believe Allah Ta'ala will not be seen in the Akhirah and so on and so on. They still maintain these beliefs. But they don't have influence like they used to in the past. All Mu'tazila, their whole idea of religion and revelation and belief was bound by the limits of rational thought and intelligence. If something from the Quran or the Hadith they found it and they didn't, they didn't agree with rationality and intelligence, they said it can't be true, it must be metaphorical. So there are people who say there's no punishment in the grave. Why? People have died. What's the point of punishing them? They have no senses and the spirit separated from the body and so on and so on. So they came with things and they said if it doesn't agree with our intelligence and rational thought, it can't be religion because it doesn't make sense. والقدري هم المبالغون في مجرى تقول الإنسان أنه لا يحتاج إلى معلومة إلهية في عمله وأول من قال بالقدر بهذا المعنى مع الجهني وكان يجلس كسر البصير وقطع وقطع البصرة عذب الحجاج وسلب وسلب الثمانين الهجرية في أمر عبد الملك علي المروان وهذا ما له القليل من المذهب المعتزلة يزعم هذا المذهب بشروط المعتزلة أيضا إبراهيم المنظم. This group known as the قدري and remnants of these things and these beliefs still exist in 